Welcome to the Research Works podcast, brought to you in association with Curtin University and the Healthy Strides Foundation. Your hosts are Dr. Dana Poole and Professor Catherine Elliott, and together we will interview world-leading researchers in the area of child health to support your practice in being more evidence-based. Well, welcome back, everyone. We have absolutely been loving our conversations with just researchers from all over the world. And as you know, Dr. Ash Thornton is still on maternity leave, and we thought we would definitely give her some time because it really is just the newborn baby life. Um, and as a result, you've heard some from other co-hosts along the way. And today I am so, so excited to introduce you to all to Professor Catherine Elliott. Uh, welcome, Kath, to the show. <laughs> Thank you so much, Diana. It is amazing to be here. I love the Research Works podcasts. I've listened to all of their episodes, and oh, good. I, <laughs> I think particularly at the moment, you just don't get that chance to connect with your professional community and to talk to these amazing international and national experts. So. This is just wonderful to be here today. So thank you so much for the invitation to be on your couch. Oh, thanks, Kath. Look, everyone needs to know, I'm going to be a bit gushing here about Kath, and I know she's very, very humble, so she'll feel quite uncomfortable about all of this, but... Kath has been my mentor right from the beginning. She was my PhD supervisor and pretty much everyone you've heard on the podcast so far, she's had something to do in their career. She's been um, their supervisor. She has been mentor. She's been co-author, really so influential. We're so lucky to have someone like her in Perth. So thank you, Kath. And I think that everyone really needs to hear your voice through all of this. And I'm just so proud to say that you are my mentor and my supervisor and a friend. So thank you. <laughs> well, we have a very special guest uh, on in a completely different time zone. So let's introduce our, our guest. I'm so excited because today our guest is Rachel Bryan. She's the lead author of the paper titled Comparing Parent and Provider Priorities in Discussions of Early Detection and Intervention for Infants with and at risk of cerebral palsy. Hello, Rachel, and a big welcome to the show. Oh, thank you both for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, Rachel is the Executive Director at the Cerebral Palsy Foundation in the USA. Um, her work focuses on paediatric rehabilitation, neuroplasticity, early detection and interventions in children with cerebral palsy. Rachel's worked as a physiotherapist in both the community and tertiary settings and she's really passionate about knowledge translation. And for those who don't know, the Cerebral Palsy Foundation is an incredible organisation that aims to be a catalyst for creating positive change for people with cerebral palsy around the world. One of the initiatives that drives positive change is the Just Say High curriculum, of which Rachel was instrumental in the development. Thank you, Rachel, and a very big welcome. Rachel, I have to say, I mean, I know you're an Australian and you're all the way in the US of A and in the Cerebral Palsy Foundation. Just tell us a little bit about how you got to be there and yeah, your journey to that to that beautiful organization. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, obviously with my accent, it's pretty hard uh, to hide <laughs> that I'm not Australian. Um, but yeah, I uh, moved to the US now seven years ago. It's a pretty um, fun story, actually. My husband and I were on our honeymoon. And he sat down with an old colleague who he got offered a job. And so we never left. Um, oh, at wow. that time, actually, I was working in Brisbane for the Queensland Cerebral Palsy Rehabilitation and Research Centre with Professor Rosalind Boyd. And um, I was fortunate enough to continue to be able to work on those projects for about 12 months when I first yeah. arrived in the US. And I was presenting at a conference in San Diego and uh, I don't know if anyone knows Roz, but Roz being Roz actually introduced <laughs> me to um, the previous CEO and uh, sort of the rest is history. And so I've been at the foundation now for six years. I was originally wow. brought on as the program director and have been in the executive director role now for about a year and a half. Wow, what an incredible journey. I love how that's all panned out. And that does sound like something that Professor Ros Boyd would do and, and make those introductions. And I think that's absolutely fabulous. Tell us a little bit about the Just uh, Say Hi curriculum that you were so instrumental in developing. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the foundation works across four key priority areas, that being health, education, advocacy, and design and technology. So our Just Say Hi curriculum obviously fits underneath our education bucket. And yes. it is really about looking at inclusion in schools. 
One of the things that we know is that inclusion in schools has a dramatic effect on outcomes for students with disabilities. So this curriculum really is about uh, creating the most inclusive school environment possible. And it's sort of a, a one of its kind, actually. There isn't many uh, curriculums available in the US like this one. Wow. And we're yeah. excited, actually, and I can announce it on here, we um, have been in New York City schools, and we're in 100 New York City schools now, but we're actually just wow. about to expand nationally across the US. So it's... Um, that is amazing. Watch this space. It's going to be exciting over the next 12 months. Congratulations. Oh, that is, that so is wonderful. Cool. <laughs> I love that we got to hear that on the Research Works podcast. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Rachel. Absolutely. <laughs> and I would actually love to bring it to Australia at some point. So I think um, that'll be future conversations oh, as well. Yes, absolutely. All that stuff just gets us really excited and, and inclusion and knowledge translation is all, you know, is what we're all about. So thank you for sharing that with us. Well, let's, let's get into this paper. This paper is something that when I read just really captured uh, my attention because I could immediately relate it to working with the children, the families that I get the privilege of working with every single day. So let's, let's get into some of the details of it. So I'll go into my usual format and talk about the population. So this study aimed to characterize and compare the experiences of providers and parents of children with cerebral palsy with regards to early detection and intervention. So to explore this, a focus group methodology was employed, and this involves 17 parents of children with cerebral palsy receiving care from Nationwide Children's Hospital and 30 medical providers who provide care for children under three years of age with a diagnosis of cerebral palsy. So the focus group was really interesting. They used a World Cafe methodology, which consisted of a parent stakeholder panel and a brief review of best evidence for early detection and intervention, and a focus group with priority setting. The medical providers were asked to then complete an anonymous survey providing ratings and the priorities of each of the themes as discussed by the parents, and both a qualitative analysis using a thematic framework based on the ICF as well as quantitative data was presented. Now, here are the outcomes. This is the first study to contrast parent and provider priorities in conversations around early diagnosis interventions and comorbidities in infants with cerebral palsy. Now, understanding the priorities of each party enables a bridge in communication gaps that are just so critical for early conversations. The top parent priorities that were identified were honesty and positively phrased messages. And both parents and providers agreed that early access to interventions were important and that discussions about how to best maximize neuroplasticity were mutually important. But there were some discrepancies that existed for conversations around barriers to access, need for education and coordination of services, participation, parent well-being, pain and vision. What a fantastic paper. Um, thank you, Dana. That's a great summary. And I think before we get further into the results, I'd really like to um, talk a little bit more about the methodology with you, particularly about the World Cafe methodology. Can you please describe this in a little bit more detail to us? Yeah, sure. So basically the World Cafe methodology is a simple uh, sort of effective and flexible format um, that you can use when you're hosting sort of large group discussions. And yep. the whole point of World Cafe me methodology and why we used it, particularly with families, was it creates an environment that feels welcoming and warm and friendly and allows for a place for safe uh, conversations. And yeah. so while we set up a couple of pre-activities, so for example, the stakeholder panel and uh, the brief review of the best evidence, the, the focus groups themselves is where sort of World Cafe methodology really comes into play. And when yeah, you think sure. about that, the best way to think about it is that you're having a conversation at a cafe. So it's really important yeah. to set up the room so that it feels yeah. like it's a very welcoming place. You usually use round tables and you have four or five people at those tables. And uh, it's just a really welcoming and sort of, uh, I suppose, pleasant environment to have these conversations. Sounds like so much fun to be involved in World Cafe. Did you get any feedback from the families, how they found the experience? Yeah, absolutely. So they found it really, um, I suppose, an opportunity for them to open up and have these conversations. And it felt less like a research study and more like they were having yeah. a conversation with a friend. And I think yeah. that's where, particularly when you're sort of diving deep into a lot of the themes that we discussed in this paper, it's really important to create that welcoming environment that doesn't necessarily feel as sterile and it doesn't put, I suppose, the clinician or the researcher 
as the expert. It really, you know, gives parents and the stakeholders the opportunity um, to discuss their thoughts. And when you did the World Cafe, I understand that you sort of had three main sections or components to that. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So when we first sort of thought about it, it was going, okay, well, if we just have everyone having conversations, they may not actually have uh, the education or knowledge to actually be informed during those conversations. So that's when we had the parent panel discussion to begin with, where every single yeah. person got to actually tell their story. So what experiences had they had? Um, what was it like for them? And the families that we actually had involved in this were anywhere from someone who had just had their child with a new diagnosis to families now that their uh, children were in adulthood. So it was really Mm -hmm. interesting to sort of hear all of their different, um, I suppose, experiences. And then the other piece that was really important was to actually present what is the best evidence currently? You know, what do we have? And we were fortunate that um, the paper by uh, Dr. Iona Novak had just been published, the International uh, Guidelines for CP. So we were able to actually present all of that information to them. That's great. And when you presented that information to them, how how was that received? I mean, there's there's a great wealth of information there, isn't there? And, you know, how was that taken up by the parents? It was kind of like with excitement, to be honest. I think, um, yeah. and we'll sort of dive deeper into this when we look at the results, but parents yeah, sure. want to hear about that. Parents want to know what is the best evidence. They want to hear how there's been progress that's been made. Um you know, what is next, what's happening and, and how can we learn? Mm, yeah, that's really, really interesting. Okay, so the other part of, of then how you extracted that information was this, through this thematic analysis based on the ICF. Can you just talk us through a little bit about what that involved and what that looked like? Sure. Well, obviously using the framework uh, that the World Health Organization developed, which is the International Classification of Function, um, we thought uh-huh. it was really important because it actually takes the conversation what can be quite a medical conversation outside of the medical model and starts to consider other things like addressing yeah. human functioning and providing a standard language and framework that helps people describe uh, the health condition and function in their daily lives. Yes. So when you did the thematic analysis then, that this is where we then can now look at the results itself, which I'm really, really excited to hear about. So I guess... There are some. There are a number of things that you found that were really top priorities by parents, and I sort of described it in the in the abstract description of it. But I thought, you know, it'd be great to hear you talk about that in a bit more detail. So, what were the big priorities that parents identified? So, a hundred percent of the parents wanted an early diagnosis if one could be made. So, I think that was really sort of interesting to us, and kind of reinforces, I suppose, all the other research that has been done in this area is that. If an early diagnosis can be made, parents want want that to happen. And um, I think the other really interesting thing is that came through a lot was that parents also wanted explanation of what this best evidence was. So, for example, they wanted an explanation of the diagnostic tools. They want an explanation of the MRI findings. They, They want the detail that sometimes I think gets glossed over when a diagnosis is getting given. I think it's interesting with the diagnostic tools that there was obviously a discrepancy there between, you know, parents and clinicians. Um, As clinicians, what should we be prioritising with our diagnostic tools? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. I think when it comes to the diagnostic tools, parents wanted what was the best evidence. So they want to use things like the Hemismith Infant Neurological Examination. They want the um, general movements assessment to be used and they want uh, MRI and neuroimaging used when uh, the, they're looking at how do we give a diagnosis to a family. And I think interestingly, they also want the components of these assessments to be explained to them. So I, I know as a clinician, um, there's been plenty of times where I have conducted an assessment and sort of gone through it from A to Z, you know, done it fast because of time and not necessarily explained everything that I'm doing to families. And Uh, that was really came through in a very big way from all of these participants that they actually want to know what you're doing. They want to know what it means and they want to know, well, what does this look like for my child? I think that's really interesting about the predicting outcomes. So we've talked about the use of the diagnostic tools, but what do parents really want to know about the outcomes and what are clinicians telling parents? Yeah, I, I think this really is an interesting piece because there was families and parents really wanted to know, well, what's the outcome going to be like for my child? 
you know, please don't mm-hmm. compare my child to somebody else. But when you're giving prognosis and you're looking at trying to, you know, tell that story to a family, it's hard not to give comparison because that's yeah. sort of what you're using. You know, when you're thinking about giving a prognosis, you're using all the information that you have from, you know, this data set of a wide range of um, children. So I think it's just interesting how it can be delivered, though, is that when they want that prognosis yes. made, all right, how is this specific to my child and what does yes. this look like? Yeah, and I think that was the part that when I, I took out of that, there was a few things and you go, okay, one, as a clinician, I need to do a better job of just actually explaining what I am doing. And you said it so nicely because you often are so pressured with time. You don't want to spend too much time doing assessments. You want to get into the intervention itself. So you do what you need to do, but you're not explaining it. And by explaining then the intervent, uh, the actual assessment itself, you want to actually then give the right information about what this means for them. And then how you deliver that is something that we really need to think about because we do have these reference curves, don't we? If we think about the GMFM or, you know, we do use them as a, as a guiding tool. How do you think we could use that? Like how can we be more specific to what families want without, you know, trying to compare to the bigger, you know, population group that we have with our percentiles? Yeah, um, you know, and it's it's definitely an interesting question. So I, I think when it comes to sort of thinking about doing these comparisons, I yeah. think sometimes, and particularly with prognosis, we need to start thinking about the language and reframing things and the way we do it. Yeah. So, for example, if you're looking at a child and on a curve and you're thinking, well, actually, potentially this child looks like they're quite severe. That yeah. language doesn't necessarily mean anything to that family. Severe doesn't mean anything yeah. to them. They want to know, well, what does my child look like from a prognostic perspective? And so it would be sort of shifting your language to saying, well, your child may never talk to, your child's going to communicate. They may just communicate in different ways and this is how we're going to sort of get you there. And I think it's sort of trying to think, well, how do we reframe it so we're not doing a comparison on a severity scale but going, okay, we know some um, interventions are going to need to happen. We potentially know equipment might need to be had. But it's not yeah. going, all right, well, your child's the worst child that I've ever seen or, or using things like that. And I don't think anyone ever intends to use that language. And I don't think no. they ever intend um, to to put those thoughts in those families' heads. But I think sometimes um, it unintentionally comes out because of uh, the explanation that you're trying to, you know, give to those families. I think in your paper there is a really interesting point about be realistic but still have hope. I think that that was a beautiful, I think, quote from one of the families that really, for me, was the take-home message um, when I read it. Yeah, that was actually so powerful. Mm. Definitely. And and I think one of the interesting things that the the families had was when they were talking about getting a diagnosis, a lot of the time um, for them it was, well, we knew something was uh, happening. We, we, we knew we were just waiting for this diagnosis and it was actually the physician's discomfort potentially in yeah. um, quote unquote delivering bad news. That was the yeah. hold up. It wasn't actually that the family didn't realize there was something going on. It wasn't that assessments aren't available to make that earlier diagnosis. It was just that there was this sort of disconnect with the communication and um, potentially this discomfort from physicians. In the paper, there was so much rich information for clinicians on um, both um, early diagnosis and also sharing that information. What would you say is, I guess, the main priority or take-home message for clinicians that are listening today from your paper? I think it is really um, honesty and delivering Mm -hmm. all the information that you have. You know, no one expects you to be able to um, do something if you don't have all that information and Sometimes it is okay to say, I don't know, and Mm. we are unsure. But that doesn't mean that you just say, we are unsure, let's just wait and see. You can say, we're unsure, but we have this bit of information, A, B, C, and D. And this Mm. is maybe what I'm thinking. And I think um, around, you know, the diagnosis, obviously, there is now language for high risk of cerebral palsy. And that was really well received um, from our stakeholder group as well. And I think, you know, the, the piece that... I took from um, when I was listening to all these different interviews was one of the the parents said is, I'm not going to be upset if my child doesn't end up having cerebral palsy. What I was upset about was the fact that I had to wait till they were three to get that diagnosis. And so it was a really interesting moment in time for me to say, okay, well, sometimes, you know, physicians will make mistakes sometimes or or maybe the picture won't be so clear. 
But Mm -hmm. as long as there's sort of honesty in the conversation and as long as all the information is getting presented to the best of their knowledge, you know, parents Mm -hmm. aren't going to be upset about that. Yeah. I think this really highlights that parents are the most important and valuable teachers for clinicians as well. And your work has really highlighted that. So thank you so much for that contribution. What I love so much about your paper, and you can hear it in our voices already, it's it's that you can translate so much of what you've what you've said in this paper straight into practice because it is not it isn't that we don't have the information already. We do. We just need to be able to deliver it in a really clear and honest way. And I'm also hearing that families do want to be evidence based. They want to be informed by what is out there, what's the best care for their child. Can I go into that in a bit more detail for you now? You did say that there was um, parents wanted to know like what were evidence based for motor interventions and neuroplasticity. Can we talk about that? Because now we're starting to go into the intervention side of things. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is where the conversation starts to get really exciting, right? Is because yeah. if we can actually bring down the age of early detection, early diagnosis, we can actually start doing interventions earlier. And yeah. and I think the the stakeholders, particularly and the parents as part of this group, really spoke about that, particularly those that had a later diagnosis. They were like, we wish we were able to start those motor interventions earlier that were specific to my child. And I think this is where it gets really interesting because we know that obviously there are early interventions that exist, but a lot of the time they can be general and they don't have the specificity that they necessarily need. So I think that was sort of a really take-home message was, okay, we, we see early diagnosis as a pathway and a pipeline to be able to start these specific interventions. I think that's so exciting, particularly with the research that's being done with um, some of our Australian colleagues. So you talked about Professor Iona Novak and um, we've also got Kath Morgan who's working with her in the wonderful GAME trial and um, Professor Ros Boyd as well looking at um, the REACH trial. So really trying to find the evidence for those very early interventions so that when families do have their diagnosis, there's evidence-based interventions that they can access and be involved in. So that's really important. Yeah, it really is, isn't it? And we're just talking about all that now and and the engagement right from the beginning. There is that engagement. We just need to be able to communicate that. Um, One of the other things you spoke about was participation and that really – that really sort of highlighted the need to talk about participation way earlier because I feel like we don't talk about that as an element till much later in life. Can you talk about that a little bit more with us? Yeah, I I think this is where, to my point before, it really is about reframing the conversation. So when we're talking about communication, that that's actually what's addressed at a really early age. When we're talking about mobility, that's what's addressed rather than thinking about talking about talking and walking, Mm, you know, that we mm. really are sort of focusing on what are these sort of more participation-based conversations and then what do they mean for these families? And I think being able to reframe that early on actually shapes a pathway uh, for success for these infants, you know, going into school age and obviously into adulthood. Yeah. And so when we're talking about those kind of conversations early on, what would you say, because there were quite a few areas that we, you found that there was quite a bit of discordance between what you know, clinicians would do and what parents wanted. So participation was one of those areas that really came up. Was there anything else that really stood out to you? Yeah, I, I think the big piece that stood out to me was that while both of them, as I said before, 100% of both parents and physicians thought an early diagnosis yeah. was important, only 50% of physicians were actually doing it. And so Mm. it's like, well, we sort of then dive a little bit deeper in, well, why is that the case? And to your point, when it comes to knowledge translation, it's not just learning about the what and sort of the why, which I think clinicians are really good at doing. We're great at learning how to do an assessment and, you know, conducting that assessment and getting the results. But are we really good at communicating those results? Are we really good at communicating a diagnosis? And when we feel like it's bad news, um, are we great at being able to then communicate that to families? And I think that sort of those elements aren't really taught to physicians. You know, you you talk about bedside mammina, we talk about shared decision making, we talk about all these different things. But I think when assessments are getting taught, um, 
the, the how to actually present that information to families should also be taught to clinicians. I think that's such an important point with the knowledge translation and there's things that clinicians are trained in very, very well and we know up to the point of amazing fidelity, but that's a huge missing piece and I think a real opportunity for learning and development with all different uh, clinicians. Are you interested in, I guess, doing work in that space? Is that an area that you're thinking of going into? Yeah, absolutely. So the foundation actually, um, in conjunction with Dr. Natalie Matry, who was the senior author on this paper and who is the principal investigator of our early detection network, we actually hold now an implementation for the early detection and intervention of cerebral palsy conference. And then we hold it every year in the States. It's now completely online, so it's going to be accessible um, oh, wow. globally. But that is oh. the focus of it. So we're <laughs> learning like these different components, but it's in workshops with okay, well, then how do I implement this? How do I have these conversations? What do I do? And we've been so fortunate enough to have, you know, speakers from all around the world who participate. And, yeah, the focus, the the difference with this conference is it has the word implementation in it. And it it really is that focus of going, well, what's next? How do we get clinicians to be able to take this information and actually use it? I'm so excited. When is the conference? (laughs) Conference is August 14th and 15th um, this year. And as I said, it'll be completely remote. Uh, and yeah, we can make sure obviously in the show notes or anything like that, that we can put the link yes. there for you. Oh, another great thing that you've taught us today. That is absolutely fabulous. Um, So I guess really just to what you sort of said there, you're really looking at the implementation of what you've done into practice already. Is there anything else that you have really taken from this work that you've been able to really shape the way that you practice or, you know, things you've been able to help with other clinicians? Yeah, I think actually the, the stakeholder framework and how we can actually have stakeholder involvement both in research, which I think is improving, you know, stakeholder involvement in research really is starting to develop and people are starting to prioritise that and realise, you know, their place. But actually stakeholder involvement in clinical practice is just as important. And I feel like that's something that as a foundation, you know, we pride ourselves in as a priority, but also in how we can, uh, you know, spread that as much as possible. I think that message of involving consumers in everything we do is absolutely fundamental and I guess a really nice way to wrap up and um, I'd love to know um, with your paper, an absolutely complete and fabulous paper, but was there anything that you would either have done differently or anything that you weren't able to put in the paper due to the editorial word limits? (laughs) Yeah, so we didn't, we were fortunate, we got to put everything in the paper due to the editorial component, but I felt like actually we could have added to the actual research. So a really important stakeholder group is actually people with cerebral palsy and they weren't part of this. So we had parents obviously who were involved. We had clinicians who were involved. But what we're finding is actually adults with CP really want to be involved in this research and they want to be involved in research that does impact infants. They want to be able to tell their story and see how that can intertwine. And I think a lot of the time we think about it going, well, unless the topic is um, pertaining to that person directly right now, then, you know, we don't really think about them as a stakeholder. But that's one thing that I wish we had done is actually look at, well, what would have been the perspective of adults with CP around early diagnosis and early interventions? Well, Rachel, I really hope I get the opportunity to read that paper and that you write it. It is a a fundamental piece of work to listen to the voice of people with cerebral palsy. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Rachel. Well, I think... You have just given so much food for thought there. I've learned so much from it. I'm feeling really inspired. And um, so now it's the perfect opportunity to head into our next segment, which is called Tell It to Ed. Now, Ed is the common man, Ed, no background in child health, and he's our producer and he listens in on everything that we talk about. And it's a great opportunity to sort of summarise your work in about 60 seconds or so. And it's a really good way for clinicians to practice talking about this research to other people and their families. So, Ed, welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks for having me. Always nice to have you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, Rachel, you've got about 60 seconds. Take it away. Well, Ed, I think, you know, one of the most important things from this paper is that an early diagnosis can and should be made. And this is because both parents want it and physicians think it's important as well. I think one of the big pieces from this paper is that we need to provide training to physicians to give them the support to be able to give diagnosis and to feel comfortable giving those diagnoses so that 
when um, a diagnosis is given, they can actually then educate families on things that are important to them and, and think about things like participation, think about things like, you know, what is going to look for in independence for, for infants. Oh, that was a wonderful summary. Thank you very much. That was lovely. All right. Well, Ed, over to you. Do you have any questions? Uh, as usual, I have lots and lots of questions. Um, I guess um, I, was, I was actually really struck by the, um, the, the communication of, of bad news. I guess no one likes to be the, the, the bearer of news that's not good. Um, but I'm curious in terms of um, – so I've heard a stat bandied about that it takes, what, 17 years for, for research to translate into practice. Um, is part of the, the reasoning for clinicians um, being uncomfortable with giving bad news – then perhaps not having all of like the, the knowledge and information at hand about something that might take 17 years to get into practice. Is, is, there, is there something there about the, the confidence of somebody being able to give bad news when it might not necessarily be as bad as it could be or should be or might be? Yeah, I think that's a wonderful question actually. And, and when we think about this sort of 17-year trajectory of research, I think one of the, the important things to remember is a lot of the time the implementation of that research doesn't happen. And so yeah. we have all this wonderful work going on, but then it stops. And so a paper gets written, a publication gets done, and then the implementation into clinical practice, there's no framework for that to happen. It's just expected potentially a clinician will read it and then go, okay, great, I'll change the way I do things. And we just know that that isn't the case. And so I think one of the important pieces that we're doing at the foundation is how to develop that framework. How can we take something that has just been published with the best evidence and make sure that it's implemented within one to two years? And we know that that can happen. We've shown it happen, actually. We've got a paper that we wrote around the implementation of early detection where across a network in the US, we could bring the age of diagnosis down from an average of 24 months to nine and a half months. And we did that in a nine-month period. And wow. so wow. I think... You know, changing clinical practice is absolutely possible. Clinicians just need the tools to be able to do it. And we need to invest and provide those resources and the infrastructure so they can do it. Wow. That was, that was great. Thank you so much. Great question, Ed. Thank you. I'm learning a lot. Yeah, really good. I'm, I'm very impressed. Well, thank you so much, Rachel, for being on the show, for making the time, for sharing your knowledge of this incredible paper. Um, as you know, for everyone, the run sheet notes will be available on our website, researchworks.net. And we'll also put all those links as well, Rachel, that we spoke about to, uh, for the conference too, and, and put that out there too. And if everyone else who wants to record this as part of your CPD requirements, remember there's a form they can fill out online and we can help you to keep that record as well. But for now, thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you both. It's been wonderful talking with you both today. Oh, lovely to have you. And thank you, Kath. Absolute pleasure to be here. Oh, wonderful. Well, we'll talk to you guys all next week. But thank you once again. Bye. Bye.